right, hey everybody. Uh, hopefully you've heard this term operator before. We're gonna dig in a little bit. Um, so you might have heard me speak about this. I've done this at a number of different KubeCons and um, elsewhere. Um, hopefully maybe at some of your customer sites as well. Um, and I wanna uh, start this with uh, kind of talking about the goal of why do these operators exist? Um, I came from CoreOS um, and we introduced this concept I think in 2016 or something like that. Um, and it's uh, all about having a SaaS-like experience on your own infrastructure. Um, so you heard uh, some of the folks at Broadcom and others talking about how individual teams are experts in their own domain and they want to remain that way and they don't need to be you know, these really broad experts on, um, don't need to know Terraform if that's not part of their job. Um, think about that SaaS experience that you get when somebody wants to pull off a database from a cloud service and then use it. You're not an expert in MongoDB, you're not an expert in Postgres, um, but you know how to connect to that, you know how your application works with it. Um, that's the goal that we're aiming for with this operator concept, um, and this is across all different types of applications, databases, queues, um, storage, um, other like DevOps tasks, um, AI, ML, all this kind of stuff, all totally works uh, great with an operator on OpenShift. So just to level set, what is this thing? What is an operator? Well, it's taking that knowledge of an application um, from the experts, whoever uh, built this thing in either an open source community or a commercial entity, um, and it's packing that into a piece of software that then drives a Kubernetes cluster. So this is, you know, at the end of the day, you're gonna have some deployments and staple sets and maybe some secrets and maybe a config map. Um, all the things that would drive an application, but as you get to a reasonably complex application, it's not just gonna be, I don't know, five of these things, it might be like 900 objects if you're running you know, this really highly scale out multiple tier application. Um, and you can bake all that expertise into an operator such that you're not having to wrestle with all of these objects. So we built something called the Operator Framework to help you do this. Um, this is a number of different sub-tools inside of the framework itself, the main one being the Operator SDK, which helps you build these operators. Um, how do you take the knowledge that's in your head about your application and put it down into a piece of software? Um, and then once you have these built, uh, the Operator Lifecycle Manager helps you actually run these on a cluster. And if you think about you know, some of these really large OpenShift clusters that we've heard about today, um, you know, it's not just gonna be one or two of them, you're gonna have maybe nine clusters and they're you know, 30 to 40 nodes. Um, you're not probably gonna be running one operator, there's gonna be a few of them. And so you need to handle the permissions, how do I wire up the life cycle of these, how do I upgrade them? Um, all of that is what the lifecycle manager does. And then hopefully you've heard of Operator Hub IO at this point. Uh, this is a community listing of operators for the entire Kubernetes community to uh, discover and play around with those. Uh, you also get some of that content inside of your OpenShift 4 cluster as well. So uh, the SDK, what does it actually look like under the hood? Um, so there's actually three different flavors of this SDK. Um, the first one is our Helm SDK, and this is great for folks that have investing, uh, invested in charts for um, Helm already, so you've got teams that understand that whole flow. What you can do is bake that into an operator so that you have this immutable artifact. You know, an operator is really some, some code inside of a container, just like anything else in Kubernetes. And um, you can now uh, stash that away and then hand that off to any um, QA teams, other teams that might want to consume your application and run it in their environment, um, their CI system, whatever it is. Um, and the nice thing is this is all driven based off of Kubernetes extensions so that you're just talking to a Kubernetes API to deploy out your WordPress site or uh, anything else, you know, your um, scale out application. Now, if you uh, have an investment in say something like Ansible, um, you can also make an Ansible based operator. And uh, this is taking your existing playbooks and other um, Ansible modules, and once again, wrapping them in that operator SDK, so it's reacting to cluster events, um, and you can deploy your applications that way. So think about all the automation that you get out of Ansible, even if you need to, um, say, poke and prod an external load balancer, like a hardware load balancer, um, and then bring that into the Kubernetes world, um, and reuse all that existing knowledge that you have, um, but bring that into the Kubernetes event stream. And then lastly, we have our Go SDK. And this is based on the same tools upstream Kubernetes uses to build Kubernetes itself. You know, Kubernetes, um, especially OpenShift, is just a series of these control loops, these operators that are running. Um, and so the Go SDK is kind of the cream of the crop for if you want to build something really super smart. Um, and we're gonna uh, bring up some of our partners here in a few minutes, and they um, are 
primarily using this SDK because they've got a ton of power and a ton of complexity in their operators. Um, and so at some point, especially, actually, who here has deployed Helm and then, um, you know, you start to template more and more things about your chart as you have more, more users using it. Um, I bet that, you know, every, every once in a while you'll just have a bunch of variables in there and you kind of wish that you had started with a complete programming language sometimes. Um, the nice thing is with this SDK, you can kind of move between these and get that best of both worlds. Um, you're also going to hear us talk about this operator capability model. So once we have these SDKs, what are you actually producing at the end of the day? Um, so you want to uh, have a high quality operator. You want that SaaS-like experience running on your own infrastructure. And so the way that we think about this is trying to move operators as far to the right-hand side of this as possible, to these phase five, these autopilot operators. Um, and this is just, think about like your ops hero. This is like a, a person on your operations team that is always on it, reacts in milliseconds, knows every single combination of every config flag, what you should be doing, every best practice about a database or something like that. Um, this is what that autopilot is describing, and we want all of the operators in the world to get to this level. Um, but, you know, that doesn't always happen at first, um, and so these uh, different capabilities in between just kind of communicate that out to the community. Um, down here you can see the different types of um, SDKs. Um, so the, some of the Helm operators, you know, um, are just interacting with Kubernetes objects, so there's not like, um, you know, log processing or doing anomaly detection is not something that you can do there that you can do in some of the other frameworks, and so that's kind of where you see this spectrum on the end of the... Uh, so a bunch of these operators have already been produced, which is great. Um, we have a certification program for them. You can find these in your OpenShift 4 cluster today if you've got one up. Um, and they really run the gamut across all these different categories, which is really great. Um, for security tools, uh, monitoring tools, um, storage, databases, security scanners, all kinds of stuff. Um, and remember, these folks have built their expertise into these, so you don't, don't need to be an expert in any of these technologies to use them really successfully at scale. Um, and we're really excited about this, and so if you um, are working on an operator and you want to get it certified, uh, please let us know. Um, there's a whole uh, kind of thriving community of operators as well um, out in the upstream um, for folks uh, just working on different pieces of technology. A little bit more about some of the SDKs and where they are today. Um, so our Helm SDK is um, uh, underway getting support for Helm 3, which was just released last week. Um, we're really excited about that. Our Ansible um, operator SDK is going to get its 1.0 version out here hopefully this quarter. Um, so they've been doing a lot of hard work on that um, using their new UBI base image if you're uh, familiar with that. Um, and then the, the Golang um, library is always getting new versions of Kubernetes. Um, so we're looking at Kubernetes 1.14, um, changing around some of the way that the modules work as Go, um, the community has changed that up as well. A um, whole bunch of other really great stuff going on there and further tying all of those together. Um, so I mentioned this uh, operator hub and uh, that you can get these inside of your OpenShift cluster. Uh, this is what that looks like today. So you've got the community listing operatorhub.io. Um, you can find that inside of your OpenShift cluster as well as Red Hat products. Uh, this is things like our Kafka product, AMQ Streams, um, a number of other things, as well as the certified operators from a bunch of the partners uh, that are here upstairs um, doing a bunch of really great work. Um, one cool new feature that I want to call out is if you are packaging an operator, we have this new um, bundle editor. The CSV is the metadata file that describes an operator, and it's got, you know, its version and the description, some of the permissions that it needs, um, et cetera, how it gets upgraded. Um, and you can actually build these live on Operator Hub IO now, which is really nice. Um, this really great form that you can see here that is um, helping you kind of fill out that whole thing and get it submitted so it shows up um, for the community. So if you haven't checked that out, please go check that out. Uh, and now I wanted to dive into just a few different kind of uh, things under the hood that I think are kind of interesting um, to y'all as uh, maybe you're getting your first dose of this um, and, you know, you're on, in like an OpenShift 3 world or maybe you've interacted with some of this and these are some of the ways that this is getting better in successive OpenShift versions. Um, so in OpenShift 4.1, uh, we did static dependency resolution. Um, this is a really key part of operators in the lifecycle manager is actually you can have operators that depend on each other. So I bet everybody here has an application that probably has a logging stack that it depends on. Um, so if you've got your um, EFK stack or whatever it is, um, you could actually defer that entire thing to an operator already deployed on your cluster um, so that your team doesn't have that operational burden. You just say, hey, I need a stack um, in prod and in dev and staging, et cetera, and you go do that. 
Um, so in, in uh, 4.1, this was static, but in 4.2, um, it's now automated. So um, through the lifecycle manager, it will go find based on the Kubernetes CRDs that you've said you depend on, which would be like that logging stack. Um, it'll go find an operator that works for you and install that. Um, so it's the same thing if you were looking for um, a database or a queue or a web server or any of those types of things, a caching layer, um, that you can automatically do this across your cluster, which is really great. Now you can do this for all of the certified uh, and Red Hat products and all the stuff I've been talking about, but even more powerful is doing it for your internal applications. So you know, picture that you've got um, a database uh, administration team that runs a tier of databases for folks. Um, you can start discovering those and using a very specific flavor of your company's implementation via an operator. Or if you've got like a standard rate limiting tier that you use and you want to produce an operator for that and then share that amongst like 10 or 20 different teams, it's a really powerful way for you know, one small team to have a big impact across your organization. Um, so if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, um, sounds like the Omnitrax folks are going down that path already, which was really cool to see. Um, take a look at some of this technology. Um, also really important is uh, operators are um, typically uh, interacting with cluster-wide resources, or at least these CRDs are registered cluster-wide. And so um, it's important to have a little bit of indirection because you don't want all of your users installing CRDs. Um, what you do is you use the lifecycle manager to do that. And so that is um, going to safely install them as well uh, as wire up a bunch of permissions. So um, I want to install this operator in a specific namespace, um, go generate a service account, attach that to a dynamic role that is only um, needs the minimum set of required security permissions, and then make that all work for me. Um, so what you can do now in OpenShift 4.2 is actually um, choose like kind of a custom run level that these can reach up to. So if you want to lock down your environment a little bit more for either a specific um, environment or a class of users or specific teams, divisions, whatever, um, you can now do that in OpenShift um, via OLM. One that I'm super excited about um, is going to help um, the experience for all of our partners and teams that are building operators have a more seamless experience is to um, be able to auto uh, install one click um, CRs. A CR is just the instance of a, um, a cluster uh, resource. And so if you have something like a metering stack or a chargeback stack or maybe even like a storage stack and you're only going to run one of them, um, inside of OpenShift now, you'll just click a single button and just get that instantiated um, versus something like a database operator where you might run 30 of them. You actually need to, you know, each team is going to make their own objects, uh, their, their do, uh, prod uh, database, their staging database in their namespaces from their quota. Um, so this is just something that's going to be really awesome for um, products that are more like cluster add-ons. Um, think like security scanners, one click install it from uh, any of the partners that work on OpenShift and that would just be a really nice way to get started with that as well as a bunch of OpenShift products themselves. So if you've checked out our new um, service mesh uh, offerings via operator or the serverless um, and Knative technologies, um, logging, container storage, et cetera, all kind of operate in this cluster singleton way. Um, so you get a much smoother installation path. Um, also something that's coming uh, in, in 2020, excuse me, is um, simplifying the object model um, for operators. So we're going to introduce a new um, single operator object. Right now, this is kind of split between a few different um, uh, versions of objects just for reasons that we're not going to get into. Um, and so uh, what this is going to allow you to do is have a really easy local dev and registration um, process for if you are uh, developing an operator internally, especially making it very easy to load into your cluster. So what that looks like is you, you know, would use one of these uh, SDKs on the CLI um, to build a type of operator, um, push it to a container registry with all of its assets, um, just like you would any other container image. Um, and then you can pull and start that on a cluster. Um, today we've got some tools for doing validation of this process, um, but we want to make it really, really easy for engineering teams inside of your organizations to build these operators, um, empower themselves to um, you know, be a little bit more automated in how they're doing deploys, doing GitOps workflows, and that type of thing. Um, something else that's really cool is, especially for any of our partners in the room, is um, in OpenShift you can extend our console to integrate your product into the experience. Um, you can also do this for um, internal applications that you have. And so some things you could do, um, like our OpenShift dedicated uh, product that we talked about earlier, you know, we swap out some logos and put some banners up and all that. It's all driven by an operator. And you can do this uh, inside of your organization as well if you've got like a branded um, infrastructure uh, team and you want to put their logos up there and broadcast maintenance messages and all that type of thing. 
Um, as well as point to like locations for getting CLI downloads that are inside of your firewall, for example, or that you know you've built and vetted. Um, you can all do this via the operator, which is really powerful. And then um, our third party uh, partners can also register. You know, here you can see an example of a Couchbase operator that has said, hey, I have a dashboard that is useful to users of this cluster because they're going to be using Couchbase. Um, and so you can start registering those inside of um, this menu. And we're going to be introducing more and more of these over time. Also really important um, is for in the uh, deployment uh, of these operators when you're actually making your instances of your databases and, and queues and things, um, having a UI to do this is really helpful. Not everybody um, you know, lives in OC or KubeCuddle, um, or not everybody has hooked this up to a Jenkins pipeline for deploying these things. Um, and so we are actually going to auto build some UIs based on the open API schema in your CRDs. Um, so if you weren't aware, um, open API schema I believe is going to be required in Kube 116. Um, for new uh, CRDs going forward. And so we can actually use that rich data to say, um, this is optional, this is required, this is an integer, this has a, a very specific um, set of inputs that are allowed. And then we can build um, Kubernetes-specific widgets for that. So if you are uh, making a database and you want to um, take some cluster quota and have some limits and requests on it, um, we actually have a special little widget that actually helps you do that and can do some um, smart validation because it understands Kubernetes. Same thing if you have an operator um, that requires a secret either to be passed into it or it's going to generate it for you. Um, it knows that, hey, this is a secret path. I can open up a drop down and actually you can pick from a secret. Um, so one way just to you know, keep these things um, easier and easier to use as you have engineers that maybe are on a whole spectrum of using Kubernetes. Some folks are you know, really deep into it and some people aren't. Uh, this is what that looks like uh, over on the right-hand side here. You can see that this is a drop-down that says, hey, pick your secret that you want to do, and this is all a bunch of secrets on the cluster. Um, you've got these Boolean toggles and things like that. Um, you can also contribute these yourself. Um, so our uh, console is open source, just like the rest of OpenShift, um, and so we'd love to work with you on those if you have them. All right, the last thing is super exciting. Um, who here uses the open service broker or at least has heard of this project um, and any of the binding capabilities that it has? All right, a few people. Um, so we're bringing that to the operator world. And what this is going to look like is right now it's a separate operator that you can find on Operator Hub. And what it's going to do is look across your cluster and try to fulfill these binding requests. And effectively what those are are label queries on each side of that. So um, a front end needs something from a back end. Um, you can match those up via label query and then get those secrets registered within those applications. Um, and this operator makes that happen. Uh, we'd like to see this probably built into the lifecycle manager over time. It's kind of in experimentation phase right now. Um, and I know this is really important for our ecosystem of partners as well, um, so where you end up using a lot of these operators together. Like I said, you might have a database and a logging stack and then your front end of your application, um, and you want to pass secrets amongst all of those applications. Um, also, uh, new in 4.2 is a new topology view in our developer-focused UI. Um, these bindings and relationships are uh, represented in that um, as well. So if you haven't checked that out, it's pretty cool. Um, so if you dynamically update these, it'll show those being wired together. Um, so once again, if you're, not, if you're a, a command line person, totally fine. But if you like to use the UI to see the representation of these applications, um, a little bit more powerful there as well. Um, and you can check this out on Operator Hub. It's a, it's a one-click install um, inside of an OpenShift cluster today. I think that is all I had on this um, side of it. So we're going to um, have a panel here.